Brokers Digest, a webcast series by The Edge Singapore, discovering market opportunities with you. This episode is sponsored by Philip Futures. Hello and welcome back to another episode of The Edge Singapore's Brokers Digest with me, Amala Balakrishna. Over the past few weeks, there has been quite a bit of buzz over oil prices. Inventory levels have been getting drawn down as demand goes up. As such, oil prices posted their biggest weekly gain since mid-March, with the international benchmark Brent crude and the West Texas Intermediate each gaining 7% to trade above $60 US a barrel in the week that ended 16th April. Besides oil, other commodities performed well too. The Bloomberg Commodity Index nearly reached its multi-year high seen in February last week. So joining me today to break down these movements is commodities expert Aftar Sandhu from Philip Futures. Hi Aftar, welcome to the show. Hi Amala, very glad to be on the show. Thank you for joining us Aftar. So Aftar, what a stellar week the commodities market had last week. Does this performance take you by surprise? Uh, not this time around. Uh, you see, the buzzword now has been commodities and the high or rather fast appreciation of prices in, in the whole range of commodities. So this time around, uh, actually, I wasn't taken by, by surprise itself because uh, it was something that was not unexpected. Had this been the... Uh, had this thing happened maybe at the same time a year ago, uh, it would have been a really uh, reorientation of your thoughts and your views on commodities. But this time around, it, it is something different. Right. So after market watchers are saying that buying commodities is an effective tool to hedge inflation risk. So as U.S. Biden uh, U.S. President Biden injects more liquidity into the market. Inflation is expected to pick up. So would you say that this is now a good time to invest in commodities? So uh, now the talk has been about the, the emergence of the commodity super cycle. Uh, a super cycle is, is just not a post-COVID rally or something like that that caused all the prices to go up. It's actually a sustained period where prices go up for a long period of time. Uh, if you look at the chart itself, right, uh, you find that most commodities are in what you call, uh, what in technical terms we call backwardation. That means the front months are much higher than the back months. So what we have is even the technicals are showing that if it has been the other way around, uh, a lot of people would have felt differently. But uh, most commodities have this uh, particular shape in the in their forward curve, which implies that uh, most investors who want to jump into the market currently rather than wait itself. Then we have uh, the other commodities also going up as, as part of the super cycle. Uh, history tells us that a super cycle comes every few years. To, uh, in the last uh, century, we had about four or five super cycles. The last one was about ended in 2008 by the financial crisis. Uh, this time around, we, we, we are in the midst of another one where prices uh, are starting to appreciate as a quite uh, fast rate. And I'm not saying that all commodities are going to go up, but the ones that would be affected by current uh, situation. You know that uh, the reflation trade has uh, woken up a number of uh, fund managers that have actually neglected uh, commodities in a sense that they, they look at it and say, oh, uh, because of the reflation trade, I want to be in commodities. 
So all of them are actually jumping in at the same time and looking at uh, commodities after some time. Yeah, I noticed that one particular commodity that investors and market watchers have been quite bullish on is crude oil. And one thing I saw last week was that the crude oil prices have been, you know, there's slightly more optimism on it ever since the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC, recently released its monthly oil market report, stating a possible 6% increase in global oil demand to an average of 96.5 million barrels per day this year. And similarly, the International Energy Agency also announced its expectations that global oil demand will grow by 6.3% to hit 96.7 million barrels per day this year. But it's also, I understand, an improvement from its previous forecast and follows the better economic conditions and the market that we have right now. So on one hand, this paints a very rosy outlook for crude oil in particular. But after my question to you really is, how will these forecasts influence the prices of crude oil specifically? Well, when you look at crude oil or, or any other analyst that would look at crude oil, uh, they would look at the fundamentals that actually drive crude oil plus the commodities itself. Uh, uh, if you look at crude oil itself, uh, there are a number of factors that actually drive crude oil. Uh, if you look at the slide, we have one, uh, the supply, the demand side, and we have inventories uh, that one has to consider when looking at crude oil. Uh, on the supply side, we have OPEC, that is the Organization of Petroleum Countries, and those out of it. So uh, non-OPEC would primarily be the shale producers and uh, many other countries. OPEC has a new ally now, which we call OPEC Plus, uh, which uh, this organization has reined in to uh, manage crude oil prices. Then we, we look at the financial market, which uh, are basically traders that uh, have their pie in, in crude oil itself. Then there is this demand side of the story where who uses crude oil? We look at uh, the OECD countries. We look at the non-OECD countries also like uh, China itself. Then we, we also look at the inventories uh, that uh, we have in crude oil. This, what's the balance? When we talk about balance in, in crude oil, it means uh, whether the supply and the demand side are uh, equally uh, the, uh, in sync. Uh, if the one side is, 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 for example, if OPEC is producing more, then we, we have to, uh, the supply side uh, having dominance. But uh, so far, what the EIA report has said that next uh, half, we will have a balanced market in the sense that the overhang from of inventories from the COVID uh, era, or rather what we had from last year would, would balance itself. Uh, countries are picking up from, from the COVID uh, pandemic and most of them are emerging out and OPEC is, has, has more discipline in managing the, the markets you know, from the supply side. And all this will in the end drive crude oil. So after now that we have a comprehensive understanding of how the price of crude is arrived at, how would you suggest our investors can decide whether or not to invest in this commodity? Yes, actually to invest in commodities, is, if you look at it, it's, it's mind-boggling because if you invest in crude oil, you, you don't want a whole tank full of oil in, in your backyard, nor would you want, say, uh, uh, a whole container of rubber uh, parked somewhere where you feel it, it is safe or you, you want to invest in, in corn, then you, you have... To, 
uh, bushels and bushels of corn in your backyard uh, or even soya beans itself okay uh, one way people do it is to, uh, for investors it, they don't go directly into uh, what you call the commodity itself they most of them actually try and understand what how they can get into futures itself uh, there are many ways of uh, getting into futures of course one would have basically a brokerage account with uh, a broker itself so the other one is to understand the whole concept of futures contracts uh, futures contracts are primarily derivatives because so they derive their value from let's say uh, the wti uh, intermediate western crude that is traded on cme it derives its value from the underlying crude oil itself so if one wants to jump in he can look at these futures contracts the thing to they need to do is to understand the benefits and of course the risk that is involved in futures contracts uh, i talk about risk itself because futures contracts are primarily traded on margin uh, what it means is that you have uh, a much smaller margin and, uh, which allows you to trade say uh, a thousand barrels of crude oil uh, if you take the the cme crude itself the the contract size i would say that if you trade one lot of the cme crude oil it will be like a uh, thousand barrels of crude and but you need not pay the full value to trade about one contract itself you can trade what is commonly known as margin itself which is often much smaller uh it's more normally below 10% of the whole contract value itself so most traders would uh, trade on margin and, and it also allows you a huge leverage on on trading itself so it it gives you a greater exposure on on crude oil itself okay then we have to, uh, other things that Uh, investors might need to know uh, in the sense that uh, which month is the most active month by active month i mean uh, because when you look at a chart earlier all right for back duration the number of months that are quoted down there right uh, for example crude oil has a number of serial months then uh, we have gold also which have subsequent uh, that means if you trade june the next one you it will take is is the august month the thing is to consider which one has the most liquidity and what is your objective itself uh, and the thing to note about futures months are that each one has an expiration date in the sense that they have a life span so you have to be uh into it okay so let's say i want to hold a contract for a day or a month then which would be the best month for you to to jump into and you also have to look at the liquidity of a particular contract and if you are a long term investor you might look at the further months for you to to hold and that's where the you look at the trend itself and see whether okay it's it's a bull trend or it's a bear trend and and how long do you think i need to hold this particular contract and also if you find all these things to mind but actually it's going not to them but for the layman a lot of them do prefer to do uh, what do you call the the cfd the contract for difference which is practically uh, quoting the spot prices rather than the future months so you don't have to worry about uh, say what the the future months are being priced at you you just pay attention to the current spot priced so the, and there are other things that you need to know about futures itself uh primarily is that they have uh financial safeguards in the sense that your counterparty is uh, most of the time uh 
assured by the exchange itself. And on top of that, we have a number of uh, other advantages. You have uh, transparency in the sense that you, you can just on your, uh, your screen at home for your brokerage account and see what crude oil is doing. Uh, or, and also we have tremendous liquidity in, in these markets in the sense that uh, uh, you don't have to worry about, you know, you want to get into a position and you, or you want to get out of a position, uh, there's no one else to, to trade with. To, uh, in fact, the, the liquidity of these markets take care of all these things. To, after the one interesting thing that you uh, that you said to me was that uh, it's important to look at the months because that kind of affects the way in which uh, commodity tends to perform. So mm-hmm. if I look at last week, what stood out for me was the price of gold, which gained two percent to hit thousand eight hundred US dollars per ounce. So we haven't seen such a big weekly jump since last December. And there's talk that the rising tensions between the US and Russia, as well as the the decline in US Treasury yields is what's driving the gold bulls. So as this bull charges on, it's now too late to start getting into gold. When we look look at gold itself, uh, we look, rather myself, I I look at gold as a function of uh, a number of drivers. Of course, uh, what I look at is to, uh, what are the real rates, the value of the dollar, the supply-demand effect on commodities, and of course, the risk. And if you look at the chart itself, uh, you'll find that it's, it's a beautiful chart in the sense that it, it gives you in a diagram uh, what most of the variations of this t- four factors affect gold. And most of the time, a gold movement is actually explained by any, any of these factors. Uh, most of the studies by uh, gold bulls have, have, have found that uh, it explains over 80% of the gold movement. This time, the jump up in, in gold prices was because of the tensions in, in between the two superpowers. And that would primarily, if you look at the VIX itself, uh, the VIX is, is actually an uh, index of, that explains volatility. So gold moves in tandem with volatility. Whenever there is a time of uncertainty and uh, investors are afraid, uh, you find that gold uh, moving up. Then, okay, but the thing that gold really moves with is real rates. We have real rates, which is defined as nominal rates uh, after taking away the effect of inflation itself. And this time, uh, if you look at the real rate itself, it's it's the uh, reverse of the 10-year yields itself. This explains mostly the movement of gold itself. Then we have the commodity prices. Commodity prices are primarily the supply demand factors that affect gold. Uh, If the central banks uh, sell gold, we we would have uh, gold moving down. And if the central banks most of the time, uh, as it is now, as in last year also, most of them were buying gold, so we have a positive uh, effect on gold. Then there's also the effect of the dollar itself, where the the value of the dollar, uh, in this case, to the, the trade weighted uh, average, where the stronger the dollar, then it people would rather look at the dollar itself than look at gold. These are primarily the four factors that would generally explain uh, how goal is doing. I think question we got from a viewer was, is silver on the way up in contrast to gold? Yes, quite interestingly, uh, it's always, when you look at precious metals, it's always uh, 
which one uh, do you want to go into gold or do you want to go into silver itself uh, although both are very very precious metals right uh, the dynamics that influence them are slightly different in a sense that uh, gold is very purely uh, precious metal whereas silver also has quite a number of industrial uses a uh, number of industries use quite a number of, of gold, especially now with the greening of the economy. Silver is also used in, in solar panels. So which one do you jump into now? Uh, these questions has often been, been, been posed itself. Uh, and you know that uh, it, the general economies are moving out of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. They are opening up slowly. Uh, industries are picking up. Uh, once we have uh, some economic growth, then the, uh, people will rather look at silver rather than gold itself. Gold is primary, very primarily a uh, safe haven. Uh, it's, it's when there is uh, Uncertainty, people would rather go for gold rather than go for silver itself. But when in times of this, and if, if you are taking a very longer term view, uh, my view is that silver would have been a, a better bet than, than gold at this current level because countries are moving out of of. COVID-19. It's a matter of time that vaccinations uh, take effect throughout the whole world. Uh, of course, we, we, we do have pockets of uh, uh, areas in, in the world where uh, things are, are not really working well, for example, in India and in Brazil. But once to, uh, the, the nations move out of goal, uh, there's a lot of pent-up demand for industries to especially manufactured goods and all so and that's where silver will come in yeah i never thought of that after like i always thought that i always hear that gold is the safe haven and gold is the one that uh, investors should be investing in so thank you for sharing about silver as well and your outlook for it so before we end today's discussion just maybe could you just share some tips and indicators that our viewers should look out for as they start their journey or as they continue to trade commodities in the weeks ahead? Right. First, first thing, uh, first, right, if you look at a commodity, you, you need to decide uh, where's the trend. Right? If you feel that uh, uh, it's the trend, it, it's in the bull, then to, uh, you can start looking at it. Uh, one way that you can look at is, I've mentioned earlier, is the the shape of the forward curve, whether it's in backwardation or in in contango. They can choose the 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 right months. Okay. What I also look at at a particular commodity is the volume. Uh, the volume is primarily the number of contracts that is traded in that particular per day, or if you look at it per week or even in, in the month. Uh, a trend would definitely be correlated with the volume itself. If, if it's in a sense that if it's a strong trend, you would have to, uh, volume itself that is rising. And a rising volume will tell you everybody is, wants to jump into that, that particular commodity itself. And on top of that, uh, if you have declining volume, but the prices are going up, uh, it sometimes gives you, uh, uh, I would say, a warning, warning sign in the sense that you, you need to relook at uh, the particular commodity and say, is it uh, topping up or is, is it due for retracement itself? Then I also look at the open interest. Open interest is the number of uh, contracts that are uh, open, let's say, overnight in, in, in a particular commodity. If the open interest is declining, it means that a lot of people do not want to be in the market uh, when the market is closed. Uh, whereas one that is 
but open interest is rising, we would find that a lot of uh, investors want to be in, in the market itself. So the, the open interest is actually a tool that you can use to find the, the gauge, the, the interest, um, at how much people want to be in the market itself, or they think that it's just a flash in the pan that I will just go in to uh, trade and then after that move out, All right? And I also look at uh, what do you call the commitment of traders report. This report is released by the CFTC. That is the Commission of Futures Traders Commission in the US every Friday evening. Uh, this report breaks down the open interest into a number of uh, sectors, whether the commodity itself is being traded primarily by the funds, or is it the producers and the merchants and is it the, the other traders that, uh, that are too small to be reported? So this particular report breaks it down uh, into the various sectors. Often uh, for traders, to, they, they look at the fund positions, uh, how the money managers are actually trading this, this particular commodity and what are they rushing in to buy or are they uh, moving out? The thing is, is to look at the fund manager. It's most part of them sometimes are, are long. And when if you look at it historically, uh, you find that sometimes uh, even fund managers sometimes do get the markets wrong, or rather I would say the timing is not right. So everybody jumping in at the wrong time. So if you compare it with the historical uh, fund positions, you find that it's, if it's overbought, a lot of funds would rather take profit for the time being and wait for retracement to, to get back in again. Then uh, earlier I've mentioned the stocks to use uh, ratio. Uh, it's, it's very important to compare the stocks to use ratio with how the stocks to use is, uh, has been previously for the particular commodity. And this one, if the stocks to use ratio is declining, it means that uh, it's primarily a, a bull market. And if the stocks to use ratio is, is high compared to the, say the previous uh, periods where you're looking at, it primarily means that uh, it's, it's primarily a, a bear market. So a lot of uh, investors actually look at it, but the thing is you've got to look at it from a historical perspective or a particular commodity. For example, if you take the, the uh, stocks to use ratio of say soya beans, uh, it is low historically, although we have a lot of soya beans being grown in the market itself, or we, we have, to, uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, a lot of demand for it. And of course the inventories are also very high, but in a sense that the, the usage far exceeds the, the one that is demanded. And the ratio is quite low historically. Yeah. Oh, Avtar, so many insights that you have shared with us. So with that, we have come to the end of this week's Broker's Digest. Thank you so much, Avtar, for sharing all your insights and tips on movements in the commodities market, as well as the signs that we can look out for when investing in these commodities. To our viewers, we hope these strategies help you in your investment decisions in the short and medium term. For more analysis on the stock market, you can visit the websites of Philip Futures or The Edge Singapore. Do like us on Facebook and Instagram to be alerted on our next episode. We will be having another insightful session with Aftar, who will be sharing more analysis on how to trade commodities. You can also leave us a comment below if there are any questions or topics you'd like for us to discuss. I'm Amala Balakrishna. With me is Aftar Sadhu, and we'll see you again in two weeks. Take care. Goodbye.